So for today's fungus episode, I'm gonna to try to do a two for one. And I'm out here in this birch thicket looking for an example of the more common mushroom that I'm looking for. Both species today grow on birch trees. One's a little more common than the other, but the less common one is more popular. So let's look around and see if we can find the first one. Mushrooms typically grow on dead or dying trees. I don't know if it was Terence McKenna or Paul Stamets that said, fungus are nature's grand molecular disassemblers. The plant world takes the ingredients of the mineral earth and the sunlight and stitches together some incredible chemistry to make these very complex sugars, the polysaccharides. They make tough, woody-like fibers like lignans. And these things are very hard to break down without certain enzymes or the mirror side of the plant world, which is the fungal world, which is hiding in the ground and in the dead carcasses of all these plants. And it basically catches these dead things and uses complex chemistry to break them down. So you have this nice mirror-like relationship. So most of these birch trees are very young with, some, with a few exceptions. So like this big dead one behind me. So I'm trying to find one that's old enough to find our first, our first birch mushroom. And I think I see some up ahead. Common names include birch polypore, birch bracket, or razor strop. Pictopterus betulina was actually renamed in 2016 after phylogenetic studies revealed it was more closely related to the Fomitopsis genus. So it's now called Fomitopsis betulina, one of several species found exclusively on the birch tree, Betula papyrifera, where it gets its name. These are annual fruiting bodies that emerge in the spring and summer so these specimens are clearly from last year as they're all being broken down by other fungi and invertebrates. If we had a fresh specimen from this year, we could tell that it is a polypore, also known as wood conchs or bracket fungi. Polypore don't have gills like common mushrooms, but small pores instead. They can also be annual, like our Fomitopsis here, or perennial persisting year after year and adding ring-like layers similar to trees. The polypores are one of the major agents of wood decay and have an important role in nutrient cycling and carbon dioxide production in forest ecosystems. They are the first step in food chains feeding on the decomposed plant material, later followed by a diverse range of fauna including insects, mites, and other invertebrates, which feed on the mycelium and the fruiting bodies, and then later provide food for birds and other larger animals. Woodpeckers and other hold nesting birds typically carve their nests in the softer wood decomposed by polypores. Polypores in general are much more abundant and diverse in older, natural forests, and despite there being over a thousand species described to science, a large segment of species is still unknown even in well-studied temperate habitats. It's possible you and I have seen some, that have yet to be named or researched. Younger, managed forests or wood plantations have significantly less habitat for these mushrooms, and some species have thus declined and are under threat of extinction due to logging and deforestation. One of the incredible pieces of this mushroom story that connects us to our own ancient human history belongs to Otzi the Iceman, Europe's oldest natural human mummy. Found in 1991 in the Otzel Apps, hence the name Otzi, I might be saying that wrong. Lived somewhere between 3400 and 3100 BCE, over 5,000 years old now. He is believed to have been murdered, as there was an arrowhead found in his left shoulder that would likely have been lethal. But much of his life and circumstances is based on speculation drawn from the evidence found on scene. Scientists were able to analyze stomach contents and pollen residues to know where he must have lived and what he last ate, and they found a number of tools and belongings. Among items like a copper axe and stone implements, Otzi had some birch bark baskets complete with two distinct birch polypores. This birch fungus, Fomitopsis betulina, 
and another birch conch known as tinder fungus uses part of an extensive fire kit to create amadou tinder and preserve coals. Our fungus, Fomatopsis betulina, has several medicinal compounds that have been extensively researched. A simple PubMed search for the genus reveals over 1,500 studies since 1946. One of these compounds, agaric acid, found in the fruiting body, is poisonous to the parasitic tapeworm Trichurus trichura, which is a source of one slightly controversial hypothesis of why this ancient man might have been carrying this mushroom. Other modern studies have confirmed more traditional folk uses, which date back over 5,000 years, indicating significant antimicrobial, anti-cancer, anti-inflammatory, and neuroprotective activities. Though not necessarily known as a culinary fungus, supposedly the very young fruiting bodies can be harvested while soft, marinated, and sliced thin like other culinary mushrooms. Though I have no experience with this, and I would not recommend you get into mushrooming for food until you really gather some experience and even find an expert to help verify your findings. Beyond the potential as medicine or food, the velvety surface of the fruit body was traditionally used as a strop for finishing the edges on razors. How's this for a chaga? Look at that. It's a big one. Chaga, or Inanotus obliquius, is also known as birch canker polypore, sell it to hipsters throughout Portland, or cinder conch as it visually represents a burnt coal. I just busted that off and it's very heavy. It is not a fruiting body like many of the other fungi in this series, but a hardened mass of mycelium known as a sclerotium. Its black color comes from a heavy presence of melanin. It is considered parasitic on birch trees, but is typically found on older specimens that are probably at the end of their life anyways, as birch is not necessarily a long-lived species in the wild, and an infection of the chaga fungus can exist within a host tree for up to 10 to 80 plus years. It is sometimes also found on alders, beech, oaks, and poplars, though it doesn't necessarily appear the same way as it does on birch. The common name chaga is derived from the Russian word, which is in turn purported to come from the Komi Permyak language of the indigenous people of the Kama River Basin. It has older traditional uses, and modern research is beginning to reveal a similar suite of benefits, such as inhibiting or destroying cancer cells, stimulating the immune system, anti-inflammatory and hepatoprotective benefits, also potentially treating diabetes, cardiovascular disease, and AIDS. A lot of these studies have yet to be conducted with human trials, and due to the extremely high presence of oxalates, a class of salts derived from oxalic acid, chronic consumption is cautioned against without understanding the potential risks. Oxalic acid isn't necessarily a toxic substance on its own, it is quite common in the plant and fungal world as a compound that helps break down minerals in the soil. One idea is that it may leach calcium from the bones or contribute to arthritic conditions like gout. So far, it has not been successfully cultivated. At least attempts to reproduce the mycelium on potato agar and other substrates have resulted in significantly reduced and differing levels of metabolites, phytosterols, and other potentially medicinal compounds. This is why I personally don't think this should be a commercialized product, but you have likely heard of it being sold as a packaged good. It only grows on particularly mature birch trees in the wild, and it's my personal opinion that this is an unsustainable practice and should be left to be gathered or at most traded among those that find themselves drawn to the forest to find it. I can concede that there are a lot of people who could benefit from the potential medicine that wouldn't be in the condition to go and gather it on their own, and are perhaps too isolated to know someone who could hunt it down. Nonetheless, this is just a modest view and not an absolute. Like most other medicinal mushrooms and fungi, there are three extraction methods that target different compounds. Hot water extraction is the most common, done by simmering in water until it's reduced to a decoction, which extracts the water-soluble compounds like beta-glucans. Ethanol or methanol extraction, which gets water insoluble compounds like betulinic acid, betulin, and phytosterols and triterpenoids. And lastly, fermentation, 
which is the most time consuming and resource intensive but may not produce standardized results. These methods can be combined sequentially to attempt to harness the widest range of compounds and it's the methodology used by the renowned mycologist Paul Stamets with his own Fungi Perfecti series of products and supplements.